I still find it hard to believe that we really got a brand new Xenoblade game this year. I feel like for the longest time we've always put it on every Nintendo Direct wishlist or an E3 that we want to see a new Xenoblade game get announced, but ever since we heard the rumor last summer of a Xenoblade 3 that's near completion, I feel like everybody wanted it to be true but deep down knew that it most likely wasn't as it sounded just too good to be true of a Xenoblade 3 that takes place in the future of Xenoblade 1 and 2, brings back some characters and it just sounded really really cool and somehow it ended up happening this year. I still just can't believe it. I remember watching that February Nintendo Direct Live just losing my mind at the fact that there really was a brand new Xenoblade game and that they were showing some of these potential returning characters. The game just looked so pretty and here we are at the very end of 2022 now having played it and ready to share my full thoughts on how I feel about the game. So I saved this video to be the last video that I want to upload in 2022 as one final send off for this year but this is going to be the full spoilers video of Xenoblade Chronicles 3 and just taking apart kind of the story and giving my thoughts on how I feel about it and what direction that it went and kind of just my thoughts on everything like that. So it is going to be a part two to the other video that I made already talking about Xenoblade Chronicles 3. So if you haven't seen that video, that's the one that goes into stuff about like the gameplay and the combat and the world design and the music and stuff like that. So if you're watching this video wondering like what are my thoughts on all of that type of stuff, I highly encourage you to go and watch that video as that is like the part one that goes over all of the spoiler free stuff this video is really just going to focus on kind of the entire story of the game and going over kind of what i really liked about it what i feel like could have been done better and stuff like that now, I do want to mention that everything that I say in this video is just my personal opinion about the game, so I'm not expecting all of you guys to agree with me, but this is kind of just going to be where I'm going to talk about kind of the stuff that I did like about the game a lot, the stuff that I didn't like, so there's probably going to be some disagreements, and that's totally fine. If you do disagree or if you feel differently about something, definitely leave a comment down below. Let me know how you feel about it. I mean, as long as you're not like a jerk about it and you get like super angry or anything like that, I'd be really willing to kind of go through the comments and talk with people about how they feel about it and why you feel a different way if you disagree with something and honestly the best case scenario would be you give a really good reasoning to why you feel a certain way and who knows maybe you can even kind of change my perspective and make me like the things that I don't like that would honestly be even better. Now, as someone who's played the previous Xenoblade games, this video is also going to have spoilers about Xenoblade 1 and Xenoblade 2. So if you haven't played those games and you've only played Xenoblade 3, I don't really encourage you to watch this video as you should probably experience the other Xenoblade games and then come back to this one. Now when planning the notes and outline for this video, I was thinking what is the best way to structure this video and talk about it and in the end, I just decided, you know what, we're just going to go through everything. We're going to go through the entire story of Xenoblade 3 right from the beginning all the way to the end and I'm going to give you my thoughts on pretty much everything that happens in terms of the big stuff. And so because of that, this video will be divided up into sections so you can click around and go to what chapter you want to hear my thoughts on as well as some of the other parts of the game. So right after starting Xenoblade 3, it goes into a prologue of Child Noah, Uni, Lands, and Yorin all going to this queen ceremony. When the clock hits a certain time, it seems like the world basically freezes for everyone except for Noah, who's kind of just confused at everything going on. And we see this big planet kind of coming together to show that the worlds are being fused together. It's from this that it immediately transitions into going into a great battle between Kevis and Agnes as the opening credits for the game start to appear. And I really like the way that they kind of do this as I personally am a big fan of games that have a really kind of interesting and insane kind of hook to get you right away invested into the game. And I mean this opening cutscene right away like with the Kevis and Agnes characters fighting each other already just sets the scene really really well for what type of world this is with how it's a war torn world with these two nations that are constantly fighting each other. And personally it gives me a lot of Xenoblade 1 parallels where we kind of have like that uh, prologue type of cutscene where Shulk is kind of explaining the battle between Bionis and Mechanis at the start, but then it goes into like present day at the time where it talks about the war between Bionis and Mechanis and how we see Dunban and Dixon and Moomkar fighting against the Mechon. It really kind of gives me that same type of vibe. One of my favorite examples of this is the bombing mission from Final Fantasy VII where you have Cloud jump off of this train and immediately you have this mission to blow up this reactor right away before you have any introductions to any characters or anything like that. It's just really cool because it's something pretty intense and gets the player interested right away. It's not like your typical type of adventure where you start out in this lonesome village and you meet your friends and it's like really slow paced at the start. It's very fast paced right away and you have something pretty exciting. 
Now something that was pretty surprising about the first chapter is immediately after like your tutorial battle ends, you have a ton of exposition dump as we pretty much had like a really long cutscene where it was actually like I would say like 10 to 15 minutes of just a lot of kind of exposition about the world for this game and kind of how everything works, which I personally didn't mind, but it was definitely something that I wasn't expecting to have right away. Like this is before you even have control to kind of walk around in the world. We have like this long cutscene first that happens of childhood Noah and his friends kind of going against some of the other characters in the game and we learn a little bit about kind of exactly how this world is structured and how these characters are only given 10 years to live how they have to carry out the service of fighting on the battlefield against agnes and how if you can make it through all 10 of your years you get a special ceremony called homecoming as the way that you die and it really kind of shows you with the way that you see childhood noah and lands and all of them react to this homecoming ceremony as children it shows you kind of how this world is already kind of set up with its design as to how these characters really feel about the way that everything works as Lance is like that's going to be me someday I'm going to go out like that like it really kind of shows you how twisted this world really is right away from the fact that they're already looking forward to their death and trying to make it through these 10 years like the way that this world is structured already like you already get that right away within the first couple of just minutes of the game without even getting the ability to kind of walk around and explore the world so I do feel like they set the scene really really well. Now after this you finally have a little bit of freedom to explore around the world but once you make it back to colony 9 it's really fast paced as once again you have like an emergency meeting that's called by your commander and right away he tells you about this objective that you have where it seems like something is heading for Alfetto Valley and he needs some of you guys to go there and handle the situation. Now on the way there, I really like this one scene that happens with Mwamba where he's looking at his hand knowing that he has about a month left to live and Lanz and Uni are talking about how they're alive because of Mwamba and he's always been there for them and he's got to make it to his homecoming ceremony. And during all of this, Noah is kind of just still a little bit unsure about all of this, not liking the fact that he's probably going to lose his friend in about a month. And I don't know, I think that it does a really good job of just showing how Noah just doesn't really like the way that the world is set up and how he has to see these people go and how pretty much everybody in the society is brainwashed into being excited for their homecoming. Now upon arriving at the valley, we finally have our first confrontation with the Agnes gang as we meet Mio, Tyon, and Senna. And of course our characters are told to kill the Agnes characters and the Agnes characters are told to kill Kevin's characters. So we just start fighting each other right away and I love how they basically go into like this really cool cutscene where it has some really nice camera angles and effects and stuff. I really like it. But then we get to meet this character known as Mobius who just comes out of nowhere and we see these characters Mwamba and Hacked get killed by Mobius which gets both of our characters Mio and Noah really mad and we start attacking and we kind of realize that like even though we were just fighting each other we're hesitating but we kind of are going to have to work together if we want to take down this Mobius character. Now of course during all of this Van Dam is there who's getting hurt as well and through all of that we awaken our Ouroboros powers which allow us to transform into this really cool creature and in doing this we're able to defeat Mobius who leaves and we have like this really nice cutscene that happens with Van Dam where he talks to all of us about how we're not really the enemies and how we basically should have to work together and try to stop the real enemy of this world and return everything to the way that it should be. Now something that I really like that happens after Van Damme passes away is how our characters don't just go into being friends right away saying like guys he told us we have to head to Sword March we should work together and head there ourselves like in fact they actually just go into hating each other again where Lance and Tyon are back at it Uni saying that she could go for some payback like they kind of just treat everything that Van Damme says as garbage saying that we should just be enemies again and Tyon even says at the end that I really like where the next time we meet again it will be as enemies which is really funny because the next time they do meet they're basically agreeing to work together and head to sword march but i do like this cutscene because of how the characters don't just buy into everything that van damme says right away so after all of this both sides are going to head back to their colonies and they're going to notice that they're being attacked because one of the mobius characters shows up and starts controlling the commanders so because of that these characters are ended up back again inside of the valley where they meet each other and they have their full introductions and this is where they finally agree to head out and go to sword march and so overall, I feel like chapter one was pretty solid. I don't really have too many bad things to say about it. I think that it was pretty fast paced. Really, the only thing that's kind of slow is kind of the tutorial stuff that they make you do, but it's also the start of the game, so it's pretty understandable. 
One thing that I wish that this chapter had was some Agnes perspective. It seems like it's very Kevis focused where the game opens up and you have Noah and Uni and Lance and they're heading to the valley but Mio is also just as important of a protagonist as Noah is inside of this game so I feel like it would have been really cool where once we kind of get the mission to head into Alfredo Valley it just goes into a completely different situation where we get to see like a perspective from Agnes where maybe like we have like this battle that just finishes against Kevis where the Agnes side wins and we get to meet Mio and Senna and Tyone for the first time and they head back into their colony and they get the mission to also head into Alfredo Valley so we kind of get to learn a little bit about them and kind of see their relationship as well because it seems like one of the characters that Mio is really kind of affectionate towards is this character Hacked who Mobius ends up killing inside of that scene with Mwamba and I feel like Mwamba we have a little bit of an attachment to because we kind of get to see before we have that one scene that happens where he's talking about his homecoming and looking forward to that and everything so we get to see kind of how important of a character Mwamba is to the Kevis gang but for Hacked I don't feel anything at all because Mio barely talks about him or we don't get to learn anything so I feel like if we did have a little bit of a scene with Hacked also then that scene would have been way more impactful because we get to see that character die for both sides. And this first confrontation with Mobius in Alfredo Valley is like your adventure initiator that starts your whole adventure up and tells you where you have to go and all of that. And if I'm being honest with you guys, I probably think that this is the weakest one out of Xenoblade 1, 2, and 3. It's not a bad one as of course this was still very exciting and I was still at the edge of my seat. But I just feel like that in terms of like kind of how exciting it was and how intense it is, I do think that Xenoblade 1 and 2 do a better job of it. But this is of course still just as good. Um, I feel like Xenoblade 1 definitely has the best one because of course Xenoblade 1 you literally have Shulk's hometown get attacked by the Mechon. You see this metal face show up and he basically kills Fiora right in front of you and that's just a very gruesome and deadly way to kind of start your adventure because Shulk just gets so enraged and he wants to have revenge on metal face and they already set up Fiora's relationship with the other characters pretty early so seeing her go like that is just a really insane way to start the game. And then in Xenoblade 2, Rex is on this ancient ship with Malos and Jin, exploring, looking for this Aegis, and then once he finds this Aegis and awakens it, Jin basically kills him right there, which is already kind of insane, as you're seeing this protagonist get killed right in front of you. Now, of course, because he is a protagonist, obviously he's not actually going to die, and Pyra revives him with like the next five minutes, but it's still a really intense kind of way to just start out the game, as you pretty much just get stabbed immediately with Jin within the first like hour of the game. Really, really exciting stuff, and then of course, Pyra awakens on the ship, we see Gramps come through and we have like this really intense battle against Malos and I just feel like that was a very insane type of way to start the game too. So I don't know, I just feel like in my opinion out of the three different ways to start the games, I feel like it definitely goes one, two and then three for me, but they're all still pretty exciting so none of them are like boring. Moving into chapter 2, chapter 2 opens up with a flashback scene of child Uni, Lance, and Noah with best girl Ethel showing up to save the day and it's really with this cutscene where I feel like it kind of shows you the relationships a lot that these characters have with each other as pretty much in every Xenoblade game in Xenoblade 1 and 2 you have your characters and you meet other party members as you're going along in your adventure but for Xenoblade 3 the characters for each side have known each other for a long time and I feel like that that's really really kind of cool with the way that these characters already have like their relationships and they've been doing this for so many years which is already just kind of really insane and I feel like that they do a really good job of using these flashback types of cutscenes where like in Xenoblade 1 and 2 there's also flashback cutscenes where we do see like Child Shulk and Child Rex but they're not really used that much. I feel like for Xenoblade 1 we just see that one scene of Child Shulk where it's there to symbolize Zanza taking him over as he reached out for a piece of scrap metal implying the Monado. So it's a pretty nice cutscene but that's pretty much all we get inside of Xenoblade 1. And then in Xenoblade 2 we pretty much just have like that one child scene of Rex and his mom showing up to Fonset Village but besides that there's not really like a lot of flashback scenes with children that are used that much. There's also a scene that I like in chapter 2 where Senna is noticing the Machina patterns on Lands and Lands is noticing the core crystal on Senna and all of those characters and how they're basically such different characters from each other and Mew even says a very interesting term known as worlds apart which is really funny because it's foreshadowing how this game is made up of Xenoblade 1 and Xenoblade 2's worlds fused together but of course the characters don't know about that. Now something odd that happens in chapter 2 is there's this one cutscene that happens where Mio asks Noah about his sword and Noah goes into explaining how he got the sword and we see this flashback of child Noah 
and how he's afraid to fight in this world and he feels it's so brutal and relentless, but eventually Riku tells him that you should have to fight to protect your friends and everything, so he gives Noah this sword known as the Lucky Seven. And of course, this is like that really special sword that we have inside of the game, and the special sword that we have kind of like the Monado and the Aegis sword. So it's kind of funny how the way that it's given inside of Xenoblade 3 is just through this no pun. We don't really have an explanation for how Riku ended up getting this sword, but it seems like maybe he has some type of connection with Melia or something. I don't know for sure. I don't really mind that that much, but but there is this one part here where Noah says like, is it okay if I change the name? Lucky Seven really isn't doing it for me. And then once it goes back, even Mio asks like, what name did you end up choosing? Noah doesn't answer the question. And I thought that when I was playing the game, I was like, okay, maybe it's gonna be brought up later, but it just never gets brought up again. Like the whole entire game goes by and they just never answered this question of what Noah ended up naming the sword. It's just a little bit weird to me. Like, why would you even mention this if it was never going to be answered? Like, it just feels so unnecessary in my opinion. So I don't know. I just feel like that that was a little bit odd. The last thing that I want to talk about with Chapter 2 is something that happens that I'm just not really the biggest fan of and I don't really know how to feel about it. So in chapter 2, all the characters get to a point where we meet Ethel, and then after Ethel, we see this console appear for the first time, known as Console K, and then during all of this, we see Console K transform into a Mobius-like character, like the one that the characters saw from El Fero Valley. And from all of this, like seeing this happen for the first time, and we have like this cool cutscene that happens where we awaken the Ouroboros powers for other party members and stuff too. But during all of this, there's this one cutscene that happens after this that happens inside of like a tent where all the characters are discussing. They basically figure out that the consoles are the real villains of the game and that the consoles are Mobius. Even Noah himself says maybe the consoles are Mobius. And it's pretty much here that I find it a little bit weird because we're only in chapter 2 and at this point they've pretty much figured out the entire villain of this game. Like, because that's the one thing that I feel like in Xenoblade games they've always done really well where whenever you think that somebody is the villain, most likely they're not actually the villain and there's something even deeper to it. So Xenoblade 1 I feel like does this the best where you get to see the main villains evolve throughout the game. So for a majority of the early game, your main villain is Metal Face where Shulk just wants to have revenge on Metal Face for destroying his hometown and for killing Fiora. But once you get past Prison Island and you get to Valak Mountain, you get to meet this character known as Goldface for the first time inside of this huge golden Mechon, and Goldface reveals himself as Egil and the leader of Mechonis. And it's here where Shulk's like, wait a minute, you're the leader of Mechonis, you're the one who's responsible for attacking the Bionis and sending out all the Mechons, why are you doing all of this? And at that point, the villain of this game kind of changes into becoming Egil as you're going after the leader of Mechonis, and once you even arrive on like Fallen Arm and stuff, like even Egil's father tells you to go after him and try to take him down so that pretty much becomes like your main objective there and that becomes like your main villain so of course Shulk is trying to confront against Egil but then of course we get to Mechonis core where you find out that even Egil is not actually the real villain but it's in fact Zanza who is the god of Bionis and Zanza is the one who's kind of doing all of this and he's kind of the cause of why everything has even happened so he's like the real true villain so I really love seeing kind of the way that the villain changes throughout the game. Xenoblade 2 does this with its villains also, but it doesn't happen as much, where for a majority of the game, you're thinking that the Torna organization is the real villain, and that Jin and Malos are like the bad guys. Jin of course stabs Rex inside of chapter 1, Malos kills Van Damme in chapter 3, Jin stabs Hayes inside of chapter 5, takes Pyra away from you in chapter 6. Like of course for a majority of the game, you're just thinking like these are the bad guys, why did they do this, what made them like this? But it's really in chapter 8 where Jin opens up and tells you like the real villain of this game is actually Amalthus. Where Amalthus pretty much has control over this entire world because of Indol and everything like that. And that's really where the main villain of this game changes. So when the Xenoblade 3 trailers were showing these console characters, I was like 99% sure that these were not going to be the real villains inside of the game and that there was going to be like a more secret villain who was going to be responsible for everything that we were going to find out later. But that just doesn't turn out to be the case as pretty much from this point on to the end of the game, the consoles and Mobius are the real villains for the rest of the game. Of course you meet different types of consoles and you have like console N and M and Z and all of that but they're still all just consoles and they're still Mobius so I don't know it just it feels kind of weird to me that they figured this out so early into chapter 2 like yeah that these consoles may be hiding something more than we think and that pretty much solves everything in terms of the villains for the rest of the game. Chapter 3 opens up with a flashback with young Tyon, 
and we get to see him meet with this character Nimue and I think it's kind of cool because it sets up his relationship that he has and that's going to have more importance later with some of the stuff that happens. I also like this one scene that happens with Noah talking to Ethel about going to Sword March for the city and Ethel doesn't know what a city is and none of the other characters do either. Of course with all these characters just being born into these colonies and having to participate in the war the whole time, they don't really learn about anything like that with school and having to like learn about what a city is or anything so it's just so cool how that word is just so random to them. There's also a cute scene that happens between Noah and Mio where they notice a baby Armu next to an adult Armu and it's really there where Noah realizes how when the baby Armu grows up it kind of changes its appearance when it becomes an adult Armu as of course the creatures inside of this world are not bound by like the 10 year lifespan that the humans are so they actually get to see these creatures change and grow over time where the humans don't because you know within the 10 years that you have you're not really going to change too much when you grow up so it's just cool to see them kind of see that for the first time. Another really interesting thing that happens inside of this chapter is that Yuni actually sees her own corpse where they find like this old colony and some wreckage from that old colony and while looking through it, Yuni discovers the body of her former self and it looks like that she was a part of this colony and that she might have even been a different class and we actually see her kind of flipping out and going kind of crazy over it but she doesn't really tell anyone so it is just kind of insane because at this point in the game it gives you a lot of questions for what really goes on in this world too. And then really the big thing that happens at the end of chapter 3 is we get this reveal of Consul J as Yorin. So the really cool thing about this is that I actually like the way that this reveal was done. I feel like at the start you have like Ysird going really crazy using Tyon's kind of bitter memories against him and everything. And then eventually that gets revealed as Consul J and Yorin. And I feel like this is a really really good kind of reveal to have because here it really kind of changes everything for Lands. Because Lands of course we kind of learn about how he never got to apologize to Yorin and how he basically saved his life for him and because of that seeing Yorin here right now it really kind of traumatizes Lance for seeing how he ended up like this and I really like the way that all of that is kind of done. The start of chapter 4 has everybody going into the Mac the Wildwood for the first time and it was really here where I kind of noticed that none of the characters really ever seem to take notice of kind of the environments around them and that was something that I feel like was done pretty well inside of Xenoblade 1 and Xenoblade 2. In Xenoblade 1 as soon as Shulk goes into Satoru March he's like I've never seen anything like this it's so pretty here. And then even in Xenoblade 2 there's things where like I think Nia points out the ether line sometimes in Tantal or something along those lines. So it's just cool that the characters were noticing the environments. Whereas inside of this game I don't ever really see anybody kind of take notice of how the environments look inside of certain areas and stuff. And especially with an area like Mac the Wildwood you literally have like a city that's fused here with a forest and none of the characters ever point that out or see how cool that actually is. We do have a little bit of something that happens with like the post game where we have I think Nia explains some of that type of stuff to the characters but none of the characters ever themselves care about it so I did kind of notice that while I was playing the game. And I guess it does make sense because none of these characters ever really did get the chance to explore the world and look around it as pretty much their whole lives were just fighting against Kevis and Agnes so I don't know I feel like because of that it might have been more of a reason to kind of notice these types of things and point them out but we never really do see any character talk about stuff like that. Now there's a really nice cutscene that happens in this chapter between Noah and Mio where they exchange flutes with each other and Mio is basically kind of just feeling the pressure of how she doesn't have much time left to live and all of that and Noah was trying to comfort her so I don't know I just feel like that this scene was done pretty well. I enjoyed this scene a lot and it definitely made me much more attached to them. And then honestly one of the most emotional parts for me inside of this game happens next inside of chapter 4 where we basically have Ethel and Kamaravi who are sent by the consoles to attack us and try to take us down and in doing all of this we basically have other consoles who are there too and because of that eventually the consoles end up controlling Kamaravi and because of that Ethel just decides to keep fighting against Kamaravi going against us and then they basically end up sacrificing themselves for us and I feel like that this scene was just so powerful because it really kind of shows you how Ethel and Kamaravi really enjoyed just sparring with each other and being friends and that was the lifestyle that they really really liked and even though that they were ordered to just kill us and kill Ouroboros they decided to sacrifice themselves and be happy doing what they love to do 
and it really just shows you their character too because even Ethel talked about how like earlier in the game she said that she basically had something happen with Kamaravi where they were sparring each other something happened with Kamaravi that gave Ethel a huge advantage where she could have ended Kamaravi right there but because she enjoyed him and she liked sparring with him and everything she let him go and because of that it became like a huge scandal between the consoles and everything and because of that they took away Ethel's silver rank and they made her back into a dirt rank and it's just kind of crazy that because of all of that she decided to spare Kamaravi there and now even with all of this happening they both decide to go together. From here we make it to Kevis castle where we finally encounter Queen Melia for the first time and we get to see her mask fall off and we get to reveal that she's a robot and a machine. So this was really weird when I was seeing it for the first time. I remember I was losing my mind. I was like, wait a minute, she's a robot? She's not in the game? Did Monolith Soft just trick us into thinking that Melia was actually going to be inside of this game? I was losing my mind, but I feel like that this actually makes a lot of sense. It does kind of feel a little bit easy, in my opinion, in terms of like the explanation for why Melia is like this. I was really hoping like before the games came out and we saw all of this, I was kind of hoping that they were going to go into like a really cool type of story that goes into like a reasoning as for why Melia and Nia ended up the way that they were in terms of like controlling all of these characters and kind of being a part in this war but it kind of just makes sense now because of how they were just robots and if there was one thing I just didn't want them to be controlled by the Mobius characters I didn't want them to just reveal their faces and us seeing them with like the Mobius infinity eyes so it kind of isn't like that in the same case either because in fact they're actually using the Queen's power from Queen Melia which we get to learn about later in the game but rather we also learn about how the true Queens are being hidden somewhere else inside of the game. Now with all of this and the ending of chapter 4 happening, we finally get a big grand reveal at the end here where we get to see console N and console M being other versions of Noah and Mio. Now to be honest, I don't know how I feel about this reveal personally because this is such an interesting way of revealing and doing storytelling in my opinion as this is a reveal that happens just for the player. The characters themselves like Noah and Mio and all of like our party members, they make it out of the castle before this reveal happens so it's something that the player knows about but the party themselves doesn't know about. So I don't know, I just find it kind of weird because this is like one of those things now where the player has more information than what the cast knows. So, I mean, we're going to go into it later because there's an actual reveal that happens to the party later. And at that point, I feel like it's not as surprising for me because I already know about it from here. So I'll go into that because that's going to happen now in Chapter 5. So Chapter 5 is considered to be like the most intense chapter inside of the game. And there is a lot of stuff that happens inside of this chapter. So the big thing is, of course, we make it to the city here where we encounter like the lost numbers who are also there as a part of the ending of Chapter 4. And it's here where we finally have Monica reveal the truth about Mobius and how our worlds are created as the entire world of Ionios is basically this world that is kind of frozen where you basically just have these two characters from opposing nations that are fighting each other all the time, giving life energy and feeding Mobius. The city I feel like was a really special place because we actually got to see these characters experience what normal natural life is like for the first time and it just feels so weird because like we're all used to this type of lifestyle taken for granted and just seeing Noah and Mio and everybody's reactions to kids running around, the elderly, people kissing each other like it was just so cool to me and it really kind of shows you where like Takahashi said how the theme of this game was life and this scene here like where everything that happens inside of the city it really kind of shows you how important the meaning of life is and how these characters don't have that in the world that they're used to. It's also after reaching here that your entire overall objective changes for the first time as now your new objective becomes to go to the Agnes castle and try to free this character Gondor. It's cool because in Xenoblade 1 the main objective changes a few times too. For the first time it just becomes like you know head to prison island and do what we need to do there and then after that it becomes kind of I want to get back Fiora because Shulk sees that Fiora is still alive. Once doing that it becomes I want to take down Egil and get to Mechanis and then after that it finally becomes I want to take down Zen. But for Xenoblade 2, the entire like overall objective for the main game was pretty much just getting to Elysium. It kind of stays that throughout the entire game. It doesn't really change. So it's pretty cool to see that happen also inside of Xenoblade 3 where after reaching Sword March, we now have a new goal. 
So once arriving at the prison and meeting Gondor, this is probably where I would say the first actual filler content of this game happens. It's not really super long, which is nice, but it definitely is filler where basically Gondor talks about how there's going to be like something happening with the prison in three days. So you need to stall for three days. And in doing that, they make you collect some items and battle some enemies and stuff. And that definitely is kind of filler. Like I feel like that was the first time in the game where I felt like I wasn't actually making progress with the main story. Pretty much everything else before that, I was like, okay, we're, we're doing this. We're getting to the next area. We're progressing. This just felt a little bit tedious, but of course it wasn't super long. So it's not anything too bad. So in escaping the prison, here is where all the big stuff goes down. Here is where we finally get our big reveal of console N and M as Noah and Mio. And this is where the party sees them for the first time. And of course, they all have shocked reactions and, and they're like, wait a minute, why do they look like Noah and Mio? What is going on? Even Noah and Mio are surprised saying, why does he look like me? And all of that. But to me as a player, I wasn't really super surprised or shocked because, of course, I already saw these characters last chapter at the end of chapter 4. So honestly, I just feel like that this reveal could have been done so much better. I feel like they didn't really need to kind of hint that they were other versions of Noah and Mio to the player in chapter 4. I feel like if everybody collectively got surprised here at this moment, it would have been such a good reveal. And just in general, I feel like a lot of people kind of predicted that console N was probably going to be a different version of Noah. Like, I just feel like that the design already kind of gave it away. Like, even before the games came out, I remember just everybody was talking about how this character looked a lot like Noah and he was going to turn out to be Noah from a different timeline or Noah from the future or something like that. And I just feel like that this reveal could have been done so much better if they actually hid that more. I feel like Nintendo shouldn't have even drawn attention to him by tweeting like this, but also just his design in general, like with the way that his hair is out and everything like that, I feel like they shouldn't have done that. And honestly for him, I feel like console N and M definitely should have had one of these types of console designs where you actually have like the helmet and they could have just had like a gold helmet with their eyeballs and like just not being able to see them. Can you imagine the reveal that would have been at the prison if he takes off his helmet there and we get to see an other version of Noah and Mio happen there for the first time with the player and the cast seeing it like just not expecting it at all honestly i really feel like if they just did this reveal better it could have beaten out zanza in terms of how epic of a reveal it is because just seeing another version of the protagonist would be such a cool reveal to have and I don't know, man, I feel like Zanza's reveal because of that reason is just so epic because it's Mechanis core. Nobody is knowing what's happening. And then all of a sudden you see this other figure just emerge out of Shulk's body. Like, it's just so crazy to see it all unfold. But I feel like this could have easily topped that if they just planned it a little bit better. And from all of this, we also get to learn that it was because of Shania that all of these characters even appeared in the first place, as Shania basically snitched on us and told the consoles to show up here. So the thing with Shania, I see a lot of different people hating on Shania the whole time. And the thing is, I feel like that Shania, as like a plot twist villain type of character, she just doesn't really hit it that well. I feel like the thing is that she actually does have a lot of reasoning and like she makes a lot of sense for her actions and stuff. But the thing is, the game doesn't explain it during like up to this point. Like at this point, I, I just feel like Shania is just a normal character. The game doesn't go into explaining it. And I'm going to go into the end of this video as to why like I feel like they should have done this a little bit better too. But the thing with Shania is like at this point, I'm just like, I knew something was a little bit weird about you, but I feel like it could have been done better. It just feels like a worse version of Dixon to me here. And I feel like that they could have done more to her in the main story so that when this does happen, it definitely feels like it makes much more sense than kind of it just happening out of nowhere. And here's really where I feel like we get to see N's character shine the most, as of course he takes all of our party characters and locks them up inside of a prison cell here, puts Mio in her own one, and then basically forces us to wait an entire month until her day is going to come where she's going to have to go. And man, I was I remember just watching this for the first time and I was just insanely depressed. Like I was like, there's no way they're going to do this. Also, Step Away playing here for the first time, the vocal theme for this. Like, this is definitely the best vocal theme placement in any Xenoblade game for me. Like, this beats every Drifting Souls moment. Like, for me, I remember I was just like, there's no way they're going to go through with this, right? Like, Mio is a protagonist character. They can't take her away from us. Like, I, I was just so unsure what was going to happen. And just the whole way that everything kind of plays out here where we even see just the way that N acts to us when we're kind of chained up and forced to watch Mio and he throws the flute at us telling us to pick it up and play for her to send her like man it, it, this whole entire sequence is just done extremely well I'm a big fan of it I think it's really really 
well like done in terms of just the way that it looks and even the shots that we have here like this one image right here of n with the eclipse behind him just really raw imagery too and i think it was done pretty well and so we really do see Mio go here as we see all of the particles come out of her and stuff. And I was fully convinced that, yeah, Mio is gone. I mean, we literally saw it happen here. There is no way to kind of fake that. So I was like, man, this is insane. So from this point on, we're basically into chapter six now. And in chapter six at the start, we get a lot of these flashbacks. And I remember the first time I was watching this, I feel like anybody would just be very confused. Like, what is going on here? What are they showing us? But this is basically giving us an explanation of how N came to be a member of Mobius. And I think that this was a kind of a cool way of doing this because it shows Noah, the one that we play as, kind of exactly what goes on. And we get to see kind of how like basically N and M tried to be together in so many different versions of their life and they just never were able to do it. So eventually N just became a member of Mobius and was granted eternity in order to be with her. And it really kind of shows you how he's changed as a person and joined their side. Now from this we get the reveal that Consul M is actually the Mio that we know and that they traded places behind the scenes when we didn't know. So this is a really cool reveal too. Like I do like the way that this happens. I mean especially with the main flute theme playing here. Uh, Mio picking up the flute and then she gives the Agnian one to Noah like because she knows. That's like the really special moment for me. It's like she, she knows which flute to give him because they exchanged. That was really cool. So it's done really well but at the same time. I feel like this is so uh, kind of crazy because like we see Mio go presumably in the same cutscene and in the same one we also see her come back. Like all of this happens before any gameplay or anything like that. So it's special the first time. But I don't know, I just feel like that this reveal and her return could have been structured a little bit better. Now, I'm not a writer, so I'm not going to tell you that this is bad or anything, but I just feel like that maybe they could have done this a little bit differently to the point where it had even more of a surprise factor to it. Like, of course, it was surprising to see that Console M was in fact the Mio that we knew. But can you imagine that after all of this, we still think that our Mio is gone and she pretends to be with N for a little bit too. So N and M go away for a little bit. We get to play a little bit more of the game without Mio in our party. We play with five party members for a little bit too. And then eventually at some point we get into the game later where console M reveals herself as the Mio that we know. Like, I feel like this reveal could have been way more surprising too if they gave us a little bit more time to kind of play without Mio and really kind of make it seem like she just she just passed away and she's gone. I feel like that's one of the reasons why Fiora's death is just so surprising inside of Xenoblade 1 because we really get to play as her for a little bit in terms of like the very early parts of Colony 9. And then once she dies, we really get like seven chapters just without Fiora. She's just not there. And we really just are like, yeah, she's gone, man. She's just not going to be apart with us. And then after when she comes back, it's just so crazy to see her reveal that she's still alive and that she joins back our party so many chapters later. Like it just feels so surprising and rewarding. Whereas here we see Mio go away and she comes back in the same cutscene. So I don't know. I feel like it could have been done better. It's not the worst thing in the world, but I don't know. That's just my take on it. But now going into more stuff that happens in chapter six, I also do like how they give us the perspective of M and how she just wanted to be with N the whole time and never really wanted this eternity that he granted for her. And I think that it's also really cool here because we get to learn a little bit more about kind of how the city happened and how N was given this crazy choice where if he wanted to be with M, he had to destroy the whole city and everything. And I don't know, I just feel like that this really gave us kind of a more of an explanation to his character too. So I think that part was pretty well done. The main objective also changes here again as now it becomes going to the Cloud Keep to get the Queen of Agnes. But before that, Mio talks about how Miyabi is still alive and I don't know, I just felt that her reaction to this was so casual and different than what I was expecting. I guess it's maybe because she was told this information from Consul M like behind the scenes. But like, she was just like, guys, by the way, Miyabi's still alive and I kind of want to save her. And I was like, wait a minute, isn't this the girl that you were like crying over in chapter four because of how she basically like sacrificed her own life apparently and how it should have been you who should have passed away instead of her and all of that. Like, I don't know. It just felt like Mio was so casual about it. And she was like, guys, by the way, I want to go and save her. I, I was expecting much more of like a surprised reaction from her. Like, guys, I found out that Miyabi is still alive. Like, we've really got to go and help her. She's so important to me. Like, 
I don't know. It just felt a little bit weird. But uh, the side stories for those, uh, Miyabi with like Mio and then also Chris with Noah, which we'll get to later, those are actually required for the game. So we do have to end up doing those. So I feel like that that was done a little bit nice. I mean, in doing that, we also got to see the reveal for Kamaravi and Mwamba again. So that was a little bit interesting. And I found that that was a pretty cool way of getting that reveal. And this is pretty much the end of chapter 6, where once we get to the Cloud Keep and we're about to meet Nia, we actually get one last confrontation here with Console D and Console J. So this is where Yorin appears. And during this, I mean, before, like we've also had some other flashback scenes with Yorin and stuff too. So I feel like for Yorin, it's not as bad because here it's actually pretty nice because we actually get to see some cool discussions that happen with Yorin and explaining how he's not really in the right that he thinks he is by becoming a member of Mobius. And Lance even gets to apologize to him. But for Console D, I definitely feel like he was done a little bit dirty because he definitely could have been just a better Moomkar character if only he appeared more throughout the game. I feel like Moomkar appears so often inside of Xenoblade 1, especially during the early parts of the game, and it's because of that that you remember him a lot more, and he's memorable because of that, as you remember his encounter at Colony 9 the first time, he doesn't even say anything. But then he's there after you get out of the Aether Mines, Prison Island, Valak Mountain, Sword Valley. I feel like if they just made Console D appear more throughout the game, especially during some of the early parts where he would just kind of interrupt us a little bit and do some stuff, I feel like that would make it so much more memorable to him because he only appears three times throughout the whole game. Like the first time is probably his best appearance where it's in Alfero Valley and he just shows up out of nowhere. Then after that, you see him at Keves Castle right before you go and encounter Melia. And then the last time is right before the Queen of Agnes. So I just feel like if they just made him appear more often, he could have been done so much better. But now here is the final chapter of the game with chapter 7. So the first thing is that we actually get a flashback here where Nia actually gives us the lore of the world. And she kind of explains exactly how the world of Ionios exists. And we learned about how basically we had these two worlds of the Xenoblade 1 universe and the Xenoblade 2 universe. And how apparently it seems like that these two worlds yearn for each other. And in doing that and using light to communicate, they were able to create something known as Origin. Now, there's one thing that I'm a little bit confused about. If somebody could explain that in the comments. How is the Mechana Sword still even in this flashback? Like, first of all, they used the wrong version of the Mechana Sword because we already see this part missing here from the city where it was taken out by the Annihilator. That shouldn't be there if it was in a flashback. But also, besides that, how does the Mechana Sword even exist? Because don't we see the Mechana Sword gone at the end of Xenoblade 1? Like, it was chopped off by Zanza, and then we pretty much have everything kind of degraded in the new world that's formed at the end of Xenoblade 1. So I was kind of surprised how the Mechana Sword was even there to begin with. I thought maybe that was going to be explained in the story of this game. It isn't. Like, it just kind of is assumed that it's just a part of the Xenoblade 1 world. So we have that, they have this thing that they create with Origin, and then they basically talk about how we have Origin which was taken over by the Mobius characters. And here we basically get the explanation that Z was able to capture the Queen of Keves, and he's holding Melia to be able to use her power, and because of that Nia had to escape him and was able to hide away. But I also like how she explains how she was able to use her limited powers to create the Ouroboros Stones, and that's how we have different generations of Ouroboros. And so it's really here where we learn about how pretty much everything is happening inside of Origin now, which is in the center of this vortex. And it's because of that that we don't have any way of reaching there, where we get the idea to have this boat that is built by this salmon nopon. It's kind of funny how the entire world is being saved by this one nopon, if you think about it. Like, if we didn't have this one ship created by this nopon, there would be no way for us to save the world of Ionios. So that's pretty funny to me, but yeah, we basically have to get the ship now. And here's where I would say that the second kind of filler part of this game begins. And this one, unfortunately, is a little bit longer than that prison section. Where here, what they make you do is they make you go around the world of Ionios and collect these different pieces of Origin metal, which have been scrapped and like left behind when Origin like plummeted into the world. So I don't know, I just feel like that this part really isn't super exciting. You're not really making any progress here. Honestly, it's probably my least favorite part of the entire game. Now from all of this, we also have to do Noah's side story, and this is where he gets to meet Consul Chris, who's Consul C, and is basically a part of Noah's side story, and I just feel like that this could have been done a little bit better too. They set up Chris like really early into the game, where pretty much in one of the very first cutscenes, we get to see this homecoming happen, and we see child Noah noticing Chris playing this flute here, and it already kind of set him up as a pretty important character right away, 
And since then, we don't really get anything about him until like very late into the game in chapter six, where chapter six is where like, I think when uh, Noah is seeing all of the flashbacks of N and he tells like that ghostly figure that like the reason I became an offseer was to learn the meaning behind the smile. And that's where he talks about Chris for the first time. But I just feel like that this was so much more later than it should have been. Like, I feel like they could have had like some type of cutscene before somewhere in the game where maybe like Noah and Mio were talking about how they both became offseers or something. And it's because of that that Noah opens up a little bit about Chris there. Mio could have opened up a little bit more about Miyabi. I feel like I seen like that would have been much more useful because then like they introduce Chris so late into chapter six there. And then the stuff that happens with him is just immediately after basically in chapter seven once we get to this part. Now, I don't even feel like that this was a bad way of going about it, but I do feel like that the structure was a little bit questionable. But from here, you basically just make it to the last area before the final boss. And I don't know, I see so much hate about Origin as like a final dungeon type of area. I feel like it's your typical Xenoblade final area where you have like these crazy enemies that are always chasing you and stuff. Honestly, I like the battle theme that plays in Origin a lot. But it's not my favorite final area inside of the Xenoblade games. I still think Prison Island definitely is my favorite one for sure. I think Prison Island, once you get to the top and you see like that bloody red sky, like I think that vision is just so insane to see for the first time. But Origin, I feel like is definitely overhated too. Like it's definitely not super exciting or like really fun to traverse. Like I'll give you that for sure. But I don't know. I didn't really hate it as much as most people do. I think it's definitely all right. Now within Origin, before you meet Melia, you get one final encounter here with N. And honestly, I feel like that this scene was done really well. I actually like this scene a lot. It's probably one of my favorite ones inside of the game. This is a scene where you just see N so defeated and devastated and Noah explains to him about the choices that he made and kind of the way that he ended up the way that he did. And in doing all of this, we actually see because like N and Noah are the same guy, we see him fuse together with him at the end, just like how M and Mio did, which is really cool. But this scene just reminds me a lot of like when the protagonists of a Xenoblade game are talking to the deep villains inside of their games, like especially the scene with like Egil and Shulk in Mekonis Core, Rex and Jin inside of Chapter 9 in the World Tree. Like this is definitely what gave me that type of vibe for this game also. And I just feel like that this scene was done really well. But from here, we basically just meet Melia as the Queen of Kebes, and then we go to the final boss fight against Z, which probably is my least favorite final boss inside of any Xenoblade game. I just feel like it's so dragged on with so many different phases, and the fact that if you lose one phase, it takes you all the way back to the beginning, like that's kind of insane to me, man. I feel like they definitely could have had some checkpoints or something, but yeah, that's kind of insane. Uh, but yeah, overall, that's pretty much kind of it, and then we get to the ending. Now, the ending of Xenoblade 3 was by far the thing that I was the most worried about. For me personally, when it comes to any piece of story-driven media, whether it's a game or an anime or a movie or something, for me, the ending is the absolute most important part. Because for me, if the ending doesn't deliver, then to me, it's like, what was the whole point of like watching this entire anime or watching this whole movie or playing this whole game? Because to me, the ending really needs to deliver and leave me with a satisfied experience. Now, it doesn't mean that it has to be a happy ending. It can be a sad ending but it just has to give me an actual ending where I feel like okay that really is the end of this piece of media. And for Xenoblade 3, before I beat the game, I was hearing a lot of mixed opinions about it. Some people saying that the ending was really good, some people saying that they didn't like the ending that much, so I was really hoping that this was going to be an ending that I would like, and I'm happy to say that it is, but there definitely is some things that I am wondering about too. So the first thing is of course this ending uh, goes in line with kind of what they talked about with the system of origin. And basically, after beating Mobius, Origin is able to fully activate again, and they're able to restore the worlds to how they used to be. But in doing that, it's going to split apart the two worlds again, and that means that the characters from Kevis and Agnes are going to have to say goodbye to each other. So we do see that happen, and it's such a bittersweet type of thing, because it's like, we beat Mobius, but now we have to say goodbye to each other, as we're going to be worlds apart. And this part, I mean, man, the ending song is just so beautiful here. It is definitely my favorite ending song inside of the Xenoblade series. And it's just really, really well done here. I really like how all the characters say goodbye to each other. It really shows you the relationships that they've built with each other. But yeah, I mean, overall, I think that this ending was done pretty well. Like, I think that this ending does leave me kind of satisfied. It's also sad because they did have to say goodbye to each other. But I'm also not angry about it or upset at it either. It was definitely a very bittersweet ending. 
Now with this ending, we also get to see some pretty cool things. So we get to see that Melia still has the Monado EX from Future Connected, which is pretty nice. But then going into Nia, we actually see that Poppy is still with her as Poppy has been living with Nia inside of Ionios, which was really cool. And then we get this really, really insane image, man, which I don't even know what to say about this. I have no words to say about this photograph. Like, it's so random. It's so like out of the blue. Like, I don't think anybody was predicting this. And it's like... It's so weird because it's not even explained. So honestly, I don't really know what to say about this. I'll just say like, it is cool to see the Xenoblade 2 cast again. I will say that. But in terms of all the other stuff that goes on in that image, bro, I, I don't know. It just happens out of nowhere for like two seconds too. And then it goes away. But then after that, it basically just goes into the credits. And yeah, that's pretty much the entire game. Now, we also do get to see a post credit scene that happens there, but this scene, if I'm being honest with you guys, it just leaves me more confused than it does after the ending. And I don't know what this post credit scene is supposed to imply. I don't know what it's supposed to mean. I have a couple of theories for it. And I mean, there's some things that people have said about how it's going to tie in with the DLC. But the DLC, that's probably going to be its own separate video that I want to make where I just want to talk about what the DLC could be like too. But the DLC is important to mention too because it basically is like a puzzle piece that is missing from this game. And we still don't have the entire full complete package of Xenoblade 3. So it is possible that maybe a lot of the things that I didn't like inside of Xenoblade 3 and just some of the other questions and things that I'm still wondering about could be answered in this DLC. So if anything, maybe I'll have to make like another video after the DLC comes out and giving my full thoughts on the final package of this game. But now with my thoughts on the main story covered, I do want to just take the last couple of minutes here to talk about some other aspects of the game and how I feel about it. So for me, honestly, this felt like the most different Xenoblade game out of 1, 2, and 3 and almost didn't even feel like a Xenoblade game to me at certain points. And I mean this in a good way, like I'm not saying that this didn't feel like a Xenoblade game in a bad way, but to me, like I feel like there's a lot of things that they did differently inside of this game and a lot of people have different kind of takes on how they feel about it. So like for one, I feel like every Xenoblade game is always about like this special legendary sword that's a part of the game, right? Like Xenoblade 1 is always about the Monado, talking about the Monado, the Monado can see the future, the Monado can do this and all of that. And then Xenoblade 2 is about the Aegis and how Pyra and Mithra are the Aegis and the Aegis did this and the Aegis war and all of that. But Xenoblade 3 is not about the sword at all. Like in fact, I think Nia even refers to the Ouroboros and even Lucky 7 as just mere gimmicks that are used to help you be able to confront against Mobius. But this whole game is not about the Lucky 7 at all. They don't talk about the sword that much either. Like it's definitely very different with the approach that they took with that. The sword doesn't even have three forms, which I was surprised by. As in Xenoblade 1, the Monado has three different forms that you unlock throughout the game. You have like the normal Monado 1, and then after Prison Island, you get the Monado 2. And then at the very end of the game, you unlock the true Monado or the Monado 3. And even in Xenoblade 2, you've got three different forms of the Aegis with Pyra as like your first one, and then it turns into Mithra, and then the final one, which is Numa. So it was just really surprising how in Xenoblade 3, the Lucky 7 didn't even have like any crazy form changes or drastic kind of visual upgrades or anything either. It kind of just remained the same as it does from the beginning of the game to the very end. There is that cool unlock of the sword at the end inside of chapter 6, but in terms of the actual Lucky 7 changing different forms throughout the game, that doesn't happen inside of Xenoblade 3. Even with the way that you get your playable characters, you pretty much get your entire party of 6 by the end of chapter 1, and it's not like Xenoblade 1 and 2 where you find different characters through different parts of the game. There's not like a secret playable character or anything you unlock either, so that's definitely a different way of doing it too. And this is also the first ever like numbered Xenoblade game without a playable Nopon, which I found that to be kind of crazy too. Like Riku and Manana can be heroes, but you can't play as them. Whereas you had Ricky and Tora, both of which are Nopon that you could play as in Xenoblade 1 and 2, which was definitely pretty surprising to me inside of this game. Even with the music, like Xenoblade 1 and 2 both have like really nice cutscene music that happens a lot, such as Engage the Enemy, which plays a lot during some of the crazy moments that happens in Xenoblade 1, especially when it happens during like Fiora's death. And then in Xenoblade 2, you've got Counter Attack, which is like this really hype song that happens when you're doing some really cool epic attacks and stuff that happen inside of Xenoblade 2, and you're confronting against the villains there. So Xenoblade 3 actually has a really epic song just to the same level of this called The Weight of Life, 
but they don't really use it that much inside of the game too, which I found really kind of surprising. Like, I was expecting this to be the full-on engage the enemy of this game, playing at the end of every chapter with some crazy stuff happening, but they really just play Weight of Life twice this entire game. Like, it's crazy. I feel like this is such a good song and it's just not used that much either. And it definitely could have worked with so many scenes. Like, look at the end of this chapter with the Weight of Life playing right now. Wait, those Levnesses. Yeah, we've seen one before. Gotta be! See, it definitely could have worked with a lot of scenes, so it's definitely weird to me how they didn't use that song that much. Maybe the DLC will use it more, but I definitely found that to be a different approach than how Engage the Enemy and Counter-Attack were used in previous Xenoblade games too. Now there's also a lot of mixed opinions about how the villains of Mobius are done inside of the game, and honestly, I actually like Mobius, and I feel like that Mobius is kind of misunderstood by a lot of people too. I actually want to make an entire video going over Mobius, but the thing is, there's also a lot of things that could have been done better to Mobius that I feel like they didn't do. So for one, Z is supposed to be like the leader of Mobius, and he basically just sits there in the theater for a majority of the game, just looking at the screen and the different events that play out inside of the game, but I feel like he could have been so much more threatening if he actually showed up and confronted the party at some point, or you had to battle him a little bit earlier before the final boss, or something like that. I feel like if we just saw him more and he interacted with us more, we actually could see kind of more of like the villain side in him than just seeing him for the last couple of minutes at the end, right before the final boss. And I definitely feel like we should have seen Mobius X and Y way more throughout the game. As Mobius X, Y, and Z are supposed to be like true Mobius incarnate, they're supposed to be like the true Mobius that are not made by other people. Like Z basically chooses other people to make as Mobius like Yorin and stuff. But in terms of like the actual true Mobius, those are X, Y, and Z. We even see that when like Nia shows the flashback of the world fusing. We see when it was taken over by Mobius, we see the three characters that show up first. They are X, Y, and Z. So I feel like because of those three being like the real true Mobius, we should have seen those characters way more throughout the game. Like X and Y should have appeared throughout the game multiple times, given us more lore about Mobius and kind of how they exist and why they feel the way that they do. It is explained for sure like why they feel the way that they do, but it's just, I feel like it could have been taken much more deeper and they definitely could have done that to make it kind of more uh, understandable for Mobius's perspective too. So it's just little things like that that I feel like could have been done better. Now, one of the other things that I have some mixed opinions on are the side stories. Now, the side stories are like the hero ascension quest and the hero quest are all done really, really well. But I want to talk a little bit about the side stories for the main characters in the game. So for the main protagonist, Noah and Mio, you're required to do their side stories in order to beat the game. However, Senna, Tyon, Yuni, and Lance all have their own uh, side stories that you can do also. And all of these are really important, I would say. And the fact that they're basically optional content, I don't really think I like because the thing is, there's a lot of plot points that are kind of opened up throughout the main story. And it's, if you want the answers to them, you have to do these side stories for these characters. And that's why I feel like if somebody who just kind of plays through the main story only is going to feel like so much stuff was kind of just left open and never answered. Where it's like, it is answered, but it's just inside of these side stories, which are optional content. So like for example, Garble is a character that you see appear in a couple of flashbacks with Noah, Lance, and Uni, and it made it seem like Garble was going to have some type of role in the game, and it's that he does have a role, and you even get to meet Garble inside of Xenoblade 3, but only if you do Lance's side story. That's where you kind of get to learn a little bit more about him and see his cutscene and kind of how he was reborn and kind of like Lance even talking to him and all of that, so you get to see some closure to that over there. For Tyon, you had that whole plot point that was opened up in Chapter 3 about Nimue and how he has this pocket watch to remember her and all of that. And you're probably thinking, like, when is that ever going to get talked about later? You have to do Tyon's side story if you want to get the answers to that, as Easter basically sends you to this area where you get to meet with Nimue again, and you basically get to do all of that stuff there. So that's where you get closure to that section. 
For Yuni, ever since she saw her old body on the ground when they were looking through like the remnants of that one colony, I was like, Yuni, you got to tell somebody about this. Like, you got to tell the party how you noticed this and what's going on and all of that. And she finally does open up to the party and talk about that, but it's done inside of her side story. So if you do her side story, you get to learn a little bit more about her and you even get to learn a little bit about Console X who appears inside of Yuni's side story. So that's where you kind of get a little bit more information about that type of stuff. And I feel like that type of stuff, like they did that in in the main story where she saw her own body they definitely should have done that type of stuff explained inside of the main story too where a lot of this is now just optional content where if somebody is doing the optional content they'll get the answers for that but if you're just charging through the main story you're just never going to get the answer to this and the most important one of these side stories is Senna's, and it's not even mainly about Senna, but it's because her side story goes a lot more into Shania, where you actually learn about why Shania felt that the way that she did about the world and the city and why she wanted to become Mobius and all of that. And the thing is, she actually does return as Mobius inside of this side story, and you get to really learn more about her and learn that she had an awful mother who really pushed her a lot and was never impressed with her and never really gave her any love. And it's because of that that she ended up the way that she did. But that's why, like, if you don't do this side story, you never really understand why Shania just betrays everybody and does all this crazy stuff inside of Chapter 5. And I feel like that's the type of stuff where if a lot of this was kind of just explained through the main stories or if these side stories were kind of embedded into some of the other chapters and we get other ways of kind of getting closure for a lot of these plot points, it definitely would have made the overall experience of Xenoblade 3 much better. Now, besides the Shania one, I still wouldn't say that any of these are like insanely crucial to do, but it does kind of suck that for the people who just do the main story only, it's going to feel like to some people that a lot of stuff was kind of opened up and left unanswered, when in reality, it's more like the answers were just put into side stories. There's even a part with Ethel that's confusing, where in the ending of the game, you actually see an adult Ethel in the final cutscene of Xenoblade 3, and that might be really confusing if you played the game because she passes away in Chapter 4, and then you see her cradle where she's like young Ethel that's brought back into the city, but then how would she be an adult again? And to do that, you actually have to do like Kamurabi's Ascension Quest, where you basically have this other side quest where young Ethel awakens, and you take her to this machine to make her an adult again, and that's how it makes sense again inside of the ending but that ending cutscene is going to be the same regardless of if you did it or not so it's just going to be something else that could be more confusing and finally the last thing that i want to talk to you guys about are the connections to other xenoblade games now before xenoblade 3 came out i think a lot of people myself included had a lot of hopes for xenoblade 3 in terms of like the fan servicey types of stuff that they could do and the returning stuff that they could do in terms of connections with other xenoblade games xenoblade 2 already does this in a really cool way where you see the start of chapter 10 basically open up with klaus doing the experiment that he does in xenoblade 1 and you learn about how basically klaus did this and split into zanza and the architect for xenoblade 2 and it does a really amazing job of connecting the games to together. So with that in mind, you would think like maybe if this first trailer for Xenoblade 3 is already showing us presumably Melia and Nia inside of the game, there's got to be some other secrets and really cool like hidden things that they're hiding inside of the game too. I feel like that's totally a valid kind of prediction or take that a lot of people could have had. And of course, like with other people, I had that too, where I was like, this is going to be crazy, man. We're going to see Pyra and Mithra come back. Maybe Alvis is going to be there. Professor Klaus, like there's so much potential for what they could do. And obviously now, after having played the games, yeah, they don't really do a lot of the connection type of stuff at all. Like, you got a lot of cool little fun references to locations and music and stuff that happens inside of Xenoblade 3, but you don't really get to see any returning characters or anything like that outside of Melia and Nia. Now, Poppy does show up in the ending, but she doesn't really have that much significance. And I feel like they could have gotten like really creative with kind of the way that the worlds fuse together and all of that. And just the way that they talked about this being like the ending to the trilogy and how they planned a lot of this for so many years. Like, I don't know, it just kind of felt like that they had a lot more that they were going to do in terms of having cool references and connections to previous Xenoblade games and the lore and all of that. And I feel like for some people, because that didn't happen inside of this game, they don't like Xenoblade 3. I'm not one of those people. Like, of course, I was let down like oh I didn't see Alvis I didn't see Professor Klaus or I didn't see any like cool returning characters or something really cool with the lore or anything like that but that doesn't ruin the game for me I feel like for some people they already got so excited in themselves and making this seem like it was going to be some Avengers Endgame type of crazy crossover with like Shulk and Rex and everybody was going to come back and everything was going to happen and then it didn't and because of that you don't really like Xenoblade 3 for what it is I still appreciate it for what the game is and I still did have a really really good time with it I just feel like for some people, because they were so 
like banking on connections and cool things to happen with previous games that because that didn't happen they're just not able to kind of see what the game really is for what it has to offer too so i'm not one of those people but i do wish that there was some types of cool connections and more that they could have done with the game now in terms of that though, I do want to talk real quick just about the DLC, as looking at the key artwork here, we can see the Monado EX from Xenoblade 1, the Aegis Sword from Xenoblade 2, and the Lucky 7 from Xenoblade 3, so this artwork is kind of hinting at some type of crossover between all of the games. So maybe it's possible that this is where all the connections and the lore stuff and all of that with Xenoblade 1 and 2 is going to happen. And honestly, maybe this is for the better because think about it. If there was like a lot of cool connections and lore and all of that inside of the base game, it probably would be at the end of the game like how it was for Xenoblade 2. And if we take all of the time that the connection stuff with Xenoblade 1 happens in Xenoblade 2, how much time do we actually get? We get like about, I would say, 20 to 25 minutes of connections and stuff with like how they explain that one cutscene of Klaus doing the experiment and then just that one cutscene that happens with like Rex and everybody inside of that room with the architect talking about how he created the worlds and how he exists in another universe and all of that. That's basically all the fan service lore type of stuff that happens inside of Xenoblade 2. But now imagine if we can have an entire DLC which is presumably going to be like Torna and have potentially like 20 hours of connections and cool lore and different things to previous Xenoblade games. That honestly might be for the better. So I guess we'll just have to wait and see what this DLC ends up being. But yeah, there you go guys. Those are pretty much all of my spoiler filled thoughts on Xenoblade 3. And I'm just looking at this video now and oh my god, it is over an hour long, bro. This is insane. There's no way that somebody has watched this all the way through. Like there's no way because the thing is the last video part one was like 30 minutes and I was already like this is such a long video. This is double that length. Like if you've made it to this point, just comment the word uni and nothing else. I just want to see how many people have made it to this point because there's no way somebody would listen to this for an hour, right? Like can you really listen to me talk for an hour about Xenoblade? There's no way. So if you enjoyed the video, definitely comment the word uni, but also let me know how you guys feel about this type of stuff too. Uh, like how do you guys feel about some of my thoughts on how I feel about the story and like the connections and things like that. Uh, if you guys disagree with me, definitely let me know why you think about it in a different way. And who knows, maybe you can even change my perspective on it. Uh, let me know what things you didn't like about it, what things you liked about it too, and all of that good stuff. If you enjoyed the video, definitely be sure to click that like button and also subscribe to the channel as well as I am going to be having some more Xenoblade content as well inside of 2023. I do want to make videos about Mobius. I want to make videos about the DLC and stuff like that too. So definitely be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on that. Go follow me on Twitter at actual arrow so you can be featured in videos and also join my Discord server as well. We've got a bunch of people in there who are always talking about Pokemon and Smash Bros and Xenoblade. So definitely be sure to join that. But yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you so much for watching.